Hello, and welcome back for part number two of Stages of HIV, or HIV Disease Progression. Uh, we are going to talk in this presentation about everything from chronic infection to late stage disease. So if you haven't watched the first part yet, please go back and watch that uh, so that uh, we can catch you up to speed. The stage of HIV, known as chronic infection, uh, is the stage that almost everybody living with HIV on Earth today is in. Um, chronic in this case means permanent infection, uh, and in almost all cases, the body, when it um, has had an HIV transmission um, and it has an immune response, the antibodies kick in, the CD4s kick in, but in almost all cases the body is unable to rid itself of the virus completely. Um, and the body is going to keep trying to fight it 24-7-365 for the rest of the person's life. The stage can last for decades, and in fact every day that we live now with HIV is one day further than anyone in the history of humanity has ever lived with HIV uh, and so we are uh, making progress and setting records even just being alive today. It is okay not to be on antiviral therapy in chronic infection uh, and later in this course we're going to talk a lot about um, HIV treatment decisions um, and when to stop and when to start therapy and um, what therapy to be on um, but as a bottom line rule not everybody who is HIV positive needs to be on therapy not everybody who is on HIV who is HIV positive wants to be on therapy and we want to uphold what people, what decisions people make for themselves, um, because uh, no one except for someone living with HIV can tell anybody living with HIV what to do. So uh, this says the need to be on therapy is based on many factors such as CD4 and viral load counts, willingness to be on antiviral therapy, and input from a medical provider. So AIDS is a stage of HIV um, that is sort of a line that's drawn in the sand. Um, we talked in this in the presentation called What is HIV? What is AIDS? We talked about the AIDS diagnosis, which is here on the screen. Um, that is having a CD4 count of less than 200 and or having an opportunistic infection from the CDC's list. So even if CD4s climb above 200, or even if the opportunistic infection is treated and goes away, someone still has a diagnosis of AIDS. And that definition might change in the future. But it's important to realize that the definition of AIDS wasn't always this. Um, it wasn't always less than 200. And the list of opportunistic infections that are on the CDC's list hasn't always been the same list. It was most recently revised in uh, 1993 to include conditions that gave more women AIDS, uh, such as cervical cancer, because before women had HIV but they weren't dying of AIDS because their OIs weren't on the list. Uh, so uh, if you um, need to review the uh, diagnosis of AIDS. You can go back and watch the What is HIV? What is AIDS? slideshow. Uh, just a brief overview of opportunistic infections. When someone with fewer than 200 CD4 cells gets an infection, it might require stronger antibiotics or faster action than if they had more than 200 CD4 cells. Uh, that is because people's immune systems don't work as well um, if their CD4s are lower. and in AIDS or in late stage HIV, infections can occur. Uh, and to prevent these infections, we use OI prophylaxis. Um, this word prophylaxis, talk about your 50 cent words, right? But it means prevention. Um, like condoms are known as prophylactics against, pre against pregnancy, primarily um, in the 50s and 60s, now that we know that they prevent a lot of other things as well. The key to OI prophylaxis is taking it whether you feel sick or not um, because it helps to bolster your immune system's response against an infection. 
So primary prophylaxis is for people at risk for an OI. And then secondary prophylaxis is for people who have had a particular OI. It's also known as maintenance therapy. Uh, so here's a discussion question that we'll cover more in the blogs, but why don't we put all HIV positive people on prophylaxis? Uh, I'm going to actually leave that to you to answer. Uh, we'll discuss it more in the future. The stage known as full-blown AIDS is still something that I hear people talk about every day, um, but it does not actually exist. Full-blown AIDS is not in the clinical course of the disease. It is not a clinical stage of age. A HIV, it is hype. The media made it up um, trying to talk about people who were very sick. Um, and so when you say full-blown AIDS, a lot of people have a mental image that happens. Uh, basically, Tom Hanks at the end of Philadelphia, um, or someone very gaunt and sickly in a hospital bed, um, and as if that were its own clinical stage. But full-blown AIDS, well, sometimes people are trying to talk about people who are very sick. Sometimes people are trying to talk about the AIDS diagnosis itself. But like we said in an earlier lesson, an AIDS diagnosis, someone who has an AIDS diagnosis, it's no guarantee that they feel sick. It's no guarantee that they feel bad. Uh, it's no guarantee that they are sick. It's a line drawn in the sand that talks about their CD4 cells. So um, we try to avoid using the term full-blown AIDS. Uh, if you're trying to talk about someone who is very sick due to HIV, um, there are a few fra phrases that uh, we recommend, advanced HIV, late stage, or end stage disease. Um, and really the, like, the term end stage disease is often reserved for people who have um, under 50 CD4 cells or whose prognosis is very bad, um, but the HIV AIDS world, the HIV movement, um, is full of many people who were told 20 years ago that they had two months to live or less and they're still here. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, we uh, exist here to help them speak for themselves. Uh, so long-term survivors is one phrase that, that people use um, and another is long-term non-progressor. Uh, so this is a term that was created by people living with HIV and AIDS in the 80s. Um, and it's those people exactly who I was talking about who were living much longer than anyone who'd expected them to. So in the late 80s and early 90s, they asked to be studied. They figured, you know, something's going right in my body where you say it should be going wrong. Will you please figure out what it is to help other people? So, thanks in large part to studies of long-term survivors, there's really been a revolution in the understanding of HIV infection. Um, and so that is, we've completed what's known as the clinical course of HIV with all the different stages it goes through. But we know that there are many other things um, that can affect how quickly or slowly HIV progresses, and that's part of why there's not a crystal ball. Um, the following list has some factors that can contribute to or slow down the progression of HIV. Um, and so this is some data about cofactors in the progression of HIV, what scientists think can speed up or slow down the progress of HIV. Uh, I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, and I'm not going to mention everything that's on here, um, but we know that, for instance, stress plays a significant role in HIV progression and it can speed up progression. Um, uh, alcohol, heavy alcohol users taking heart are four times less likely to go undetectable um, than those who do not use alcohol, but other studies have found no relationship with regard to HIV progression. Uh, lack of social support seems to accelerate the course of HIV progression. Uh, homelessness or stability in, life, in lifestyle is an important factor in determining the level of compliance or adherence with medications, um, but that doesn't necessarily speak to progression. Um, we'll be talking more about hepatitis C in the future. Uh, weekly use of hallucinogens um, strongly and independently predicts death as well as progression of HIV. Um, and uh, pessimism, tuberculosis, um, all of these things seem to have 
uh, some impact in HIV disease, uh, but we'll be talking about this more in the future.